Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, we actually didn't know that um, this panel was going to be following the well-played session, so I'm really excited that we're now going to get to go behind the scenes and learn about how this game and how games like this were made. Yeah, that first slide will be perfect. Thank you so much. But before we do, there's two things I wanted to do. This topic that we're about to address about game design, identity, is not starting right now. It's actually been brought up a number of times over the last few days around transgender identity, about Saudi women, and what we're hoping is not to start or end that conversation, but just contribute to it uh, and have this be something that we can continue to address here within um, the Games for Change space. The second thing I wanted to do was explain where this panel came from. Uh, as was just mentioned, I work at the American Museum of Natural History here in New York City. Have you guys heard of it before? <laughs> All right. Who, who's, uh, let's see, who's seen dinosaurs there before? Put up your hand. Great. Who's seen a whale there? Or whale. Excellent. Well, if you went there just over a century ago, you might have been going to the opening of an exciting new hall, the Hall of Northwest Coast Indians. And in short, this hall was one of, get ready if you're on Twitter here to send this out. The Hall of Northwest Coast Indians is one of the greatest weapons against racism in the 20th century. And it's a long story, but in short, this hall overthrew the notion, the racist idea at the time, that indigenous people culturally were less evolved than folks in Asia who were less involved from folks coming from Europe. And it introduced the idea of cultural relativism through the work of, of Franz Boas, who designed the hall and led the research around it. Now, a century later, as me and others at the museum are trying to figure out how to connect contemporary visitors to that space and the communities represented in that hall, it's been very moving for me to work with those communities and learn the techniques they've developed to resist the over century of cultural genocide they had to face. And to learn that game design, as you just saw, has become just one of those many techniques I thought was fascinating and worth exploring here at Games for Change. So what I'd like to do now is bring out Amy uh, Frieden, who is one of the movers and shakers behind the game. Amy, would you please come out? Let's give it up for Amy. Amy's the executive vice president and CFO of the Cook Inlet Tribal Council and the CFO of Eline Media. Um, and we brought her out here to share with us about Never Alone. Let's see if I can do this, which is also in Inupiaq, pronounced Kis Ima Ignik Tuna. Getting there. Thank you. Um, Amy herself is also of Inupiaq heritage and served as the lead cultural ambassador for this remarkable game. Nearly 40 Alaska Native elders, storytellers, and community members contributed to the development of the game which features a young Inupiaq girl, as you saw, and Fox, setting out on an adventure to solve the mystery of an endless blizzard. Originally, we were going to show a video, but you just watched it for a half hour, so we won't need to do that. Now, to join the conversation, I'd like to also bring out Amy. Amy, would you please come out? Oh, excuse me. Um, Meg, excuse me. I knew I was going to do that. Apologies. <laughs> Meg, please come out. Meg, this is uh, Meg Giants. Thank you. And I'm going to show her video uh, from her, the game she worked on as I introduce her and talk about the game, if I can do it right this time. There we go. So Meg is a freelance writer and game maker and winner of the 2014 Writers Guild of Great Britain's Award for Video Games. She was a lead writer of the steampunk adventure game, 80 Days, which was praised for its anti-colonial, culturally respectful and inclusive approach and has received numerous accolades. Telegraph's Best Novel of 2014, and yes, that I did say right, Best Novel of 2014, and Time Magazine's Game of the Year 2014. So, when we first spoke about putting this panel together, the original title that I'd proposed was Cultural Liberation Through Game Design. And you both immediately said, no, it doesn't sound right. Reclaiming culture seemed to be the right tone. Can you share more about what your thinking was behind that and what this topic means for both of you? Well, I'll go ahead and start. I think my first initial reaction, and I'm so glad that Meg had the same reaction so we could retitle it, was that there are so many beautiful living cultures out there in the world that it wasn't about re liberating it. It was about sharing and celebrating cultures from around the world. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, kind of in addition to that, um, at least my approach with 80 Days 
it was less about kind of liberating a culture and more about getting to rewrite the stories um, that traditionally either people like me and marginalized people wouldn't have uh, ha had access to or be able to tell, or they were stories that were told by outsiders and you know colonial forces and imperialists. And it was really powerful for me to be able to write a story in a, in a bunch of kind of genres and modes, so steampunk, um, historical fiction, fundamentally games in general, where kind of the voices of people like me are almost entirely absent, and that's only changing now. But to be able to rewrite those stories and put yourself into the narrative to kind of write a game where people like me are heroes, and that felt really powerful. You know, you're both working from traditional texts, mm -hmm. but also changing them in ways that made sense both for contemporary voices and in, in gameplay. Can you talk about decisions you had to make to both be authentic to the original, but also changing it in ways that you needed to for your own contemporary reasons? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, so the thing is, 80 Days and Never Alone come from very different places, which is why I think this panel is so interesting. Um, 80 Days is a, frankly, commercial game. It's, you know, the point is fun, we want to sell. Um, and the, you know, and the, the kind of inclusive approach is almost a kind of, I mean, I wouldn't say it's secondary, it was, it was, it was incredibly important to me to, to be incredibly respectful about it, but that wasn't kind of the, that wasn't the spark that inspired the game. That wasn't why we were telling this game. We just wanted to tell a great adventure story. Um, and so I think that meant that, um, that it was a kind of, it was, for me, it started out as a much more personal thing. So when I was a teenager, the first time I read Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne, I, rem I loved the book, but I remember the character of Alda, who, if you're not familiar with it, is, is the Indian princess that um, Fogg encounters, who saves from uh, Kali Sogis, who saves her from Sati, and she very gratefully kind of falls in love with him, and at the end, he thinks he loses the race, and he gets married to her because, you know, it was all about love or whatever. I mean, she's basically a kind of colonial, she is, she is India, and she's a colonial subject, kind of grateful for the conqueror. She wants to be ruled. And it encapsulated all of the things that I found uncomfortable about reading 80 Days as an Indian woman. Um, and so I was very deeply aware that I didn't, I, you know, I wanted to rewrite Alda in, you know, when I got a chance to kind of have a conversation with Vern. But also I didn't want to commit that same kind of violence upon any other culture. Uh, and so it became incredibly important to me to be as kind of specific and respectful of, of every culture that we encounter in, in 80 Days as we expand the globe. Um, but also do that with a kind of sense of fun uh, and joy. And, you know, I think there's this weird idea that you can either be kind of culturally respectful or you can be interesting, which is so ridiculous. Um, you know, and so it was really important to kind of do that without being preachy. Can, so can you share more about how you did that and how you did it in a way that put the player in, the, in a role of agency that only a game could do? Right. Well, actually, interestingly, I think the way in which we did that was by acknowledging that Caspar II and Fogg, the main characters of the game, there are gonna be times where they're just not the most important person in the world. And actually we take away agency from them sometimes and give it to the other characters that you encounter. So when you see out, when you meet Auda in our game, um, she's plotting a revolution of her own and you kind of just get caught up in it and she takes you hostage and you have to kind of negotiate your way out of that. And you know she doesn't actually really want or need your help with her revolution because you have no business being there, and that's kind of okay. I mean, I think it's it's okay for games to be less about saving. I mean, there are so many games about saving the world. I think it's okay to write and make games that maybe aren't and that maybe place you in a position where you are not all powerful. I mean, the thing that we really really wanted to do was reject the white savior myth. Like we could not have Fog and Passepartout, two white European men go into all of these amazing cultures and places and fix their problems. Um, you know, that would have been pretty horrible. Um, which is an interesting kind of game design challenge because there are times where you encounter slavers and you can't free the slaves. Um, and John and I, like my colleague at Inkle, we went back and forth about how do you make that an interesting choice and decision for the player. Um, Just and for those who haven't played it. And sometimes you actually can choose to work with the slavers. Yes. Yes, but you get, and you get narratively punished. Rather, there is no morality meter in the game. But you know, if you work with the slavers, then um, nobody else wants to take you anywhere. When you get to the new city, they saw you get off on a slaver ship, and you end up having to go on a slave catching mission. And you essentially watch helplessly as innocent villagers are kind of, you know, rounded up and and sold in the 
next course. And it's, it's deliberately gruesome. Um, but it's also, frankly, it's not a great game, like in terms of game design, it's not a great moment of game design. You don't have all of the choices, but it was really important kind of thematically and culturally to keep that. So I think one of the things that you emphasize, and I completely agree, is that if you are going to be able to use games as storytelling, they have to be fun. They have to invite the audience in. If you think about growing up, all of us grew up you know, listening to bedtime stories with our parents. For the Nupiat culture in particular, it was really important to all of our methods of storytelling, whether it was oral, dancing, the story knife, um, or scrimshaw, were really important because we had no written history. We had no written way to pass along our stories. And so for us, storytelling took on this way of really passing wisdom from one generation to the next. And taking it to video games seemed a little nerve wracking at first. I have to admit being a Nupiak, I was nervous about doing a game based on my culture because I didn't want to feel like I was appropriating my own culture, ironically. But I think the way it was done where we really developed an inclusive development process um, where we partnered with Eline Media to make this amazing game really turned out well. And so throughout the process, not only did we engage storytellers, we engaged elders and youth and community members to help us kind of work through some of those difficult issues. Um, the story of uh, Never Alone is based on Kunuk Sayoka, which is about an endless blizzard. And we didn't, you know, go word for word with that story because, you know, telling the story itself takes less than 15 minutes. So we had to weave in other themes from other traditional stories, but we had to get permission to do that. And the mm -hmm. way to do that was really to work with the community and allow the community as a whole become the storytellers. And what did permission look like in that context? What, what, did, what were you looking for? What did you need to, to get the support that was required to move forward and know that you were adapting both the story and the mode of storytelling into new medium in a way that, that you felt represented the community? Well, first and foremost, we had to go find um, the person who kind of was the story holder for mm -hmm. Kanuk Sayuka. And so Robert Nasrat Cleveland was the storyteller most associated with the Kanuk Sayuka story. So he had passed away many years since, and so we had to go find his eldest daughter. Her name's Minnie Gray. She's this wonderful Alaska Native treasure elder for us. And you know, we knew she grew up in Ambler. We looked for her there. We knew she was in Fairbanks. Um, we looked for her there. It turned out she was two blocks from my offices, <laughs> and it took us a few months to <laughs> find her. But it was <laughs> <laughs> embarrassingly. Um, but it's one of those things: is you have to be out there in the community and connecting with people to get the right access. So we went to her apartment. Um, all of her great grandkids and grandkids were crawling all over the place, and you know, we talked about what we wanted to do and. You know, she looked at her grandkids and looked at us and basically said, you know, of course you should tell the story of Kanuk Sayuka through video games. This is where my grandkids are doing. They're playing video games. And then she went even further in later meetings with her to say, well, it's okay to modify the story because every storyteller tells the story different. They may use a different cadence. They may emphasize different pieces or uh, different messages in the story, depending on who the audience is and what they want that particular person to hear. So it was really rewarding, but I think what was amazing through the process is after we built the game and we started playing it, is I really realized that we transferred the role of the storyteller from you know Minnie Gree and her father, from the game design team to the player. So mm -hmm. when you play, you are telling the story, you're engaged in it, and you're directing where it goes. And so that's true, it sounds like, between both of the games. Both of the games put the player in the sense of being the one who drives the story. Yeah, I mean, it's really, so I love hearing about the process of Neverland, and I think it's just, it's, yeah, I have the greatest respect for it. And it's, you know, uh, but it's the kind of, I think it's a process that not many game makers have access to or even kind of know that they need. Um, and I've got to say, like, being perfectly frank, with 80 days, given the fact that, you know, we deal with so many different cultures. And uh, in 1872, like quite a lot of those cultures aren't necessarily living, or even if they are, it's, you know, not the same. You, it, you know, we couldn't actually go and find someone um, who was alive back then to tell us exactly how it was. So there is a, an amount of invention and there is, you know, in some ways there's no permission that you can seek. And even if we could, I don't like in, I don't know if there would ever be enough time to kind of do that individually in each way. So the question is kind of, I guess, we have to ask ourselves is how can we still be respectful in doing that? And that has kind of two answers, one of which is go into it 
knowing or kind of telling yourself that you will be open to criticism when you get it because I think that's hugely important um, because you are, I think, I don't know, like I think I realize I, we are going to get some things wrong. We, we just are. Um, and the way to deal with that is through trying not to be defensive and through trying to be as kind of open as people's criticism. And the other way we do that in 80 days is the vastness of the game. So there is no single story of India in the game because there are, you know, dozens, possibly even hundreds of Indians in the game. There are dozens of South Africans. There are dozens of people in Bahrain, in Saudi Arabia, in Lebanon, um, which means that the kind of weight of representation is taken away. So this isn't the definitive story of this culture. It's just one person. And so we shift the emphasis from kind of I the ideological and political onto the personal. Which isn't to say that you can't talk about deeply political and complicated political things, but once you start talking about them from a kind of personal perspective and through these personal stories of just people trying to live through kind of this moment of historical change, um, it suddenly becomes possible to actually, you know, create complexity. Um, because, you know, I mean, there are this idea, you know, because we get to actually show that there was sort of disagreement and difference and a kind of multiplicity of opinions in any given place at any given time. You know, like there is no one perfect English gentleman, as much as Fogg would like to pretend that he is. Meg, can you say a little bit more about your choice of genre, mm -hmm. of using steampunk, a way to talk about yeah. technology in, in the, the 19th century at this time that the book was written, which was essentially England at its time control, being the most colonialist, having the most locations in the world, and this tour of it, and trying and subverting that to tell the story in a different way. Yeah, I mean, I think so. It was really important for so I think it was really important for me to use steampunk in a, in a kind of in in a very in a clever and in an engaged fashion because I think steampunk quite often can end up just reproducing the sort of colonial values um, of of the time. You know, even contemporary steampunk I think often isn't as critical enough of the the colonial underpinnings of like technological change. And do you mind defining steampunk for? Uh, wow, uh, <laughs> I don't know how you define um, steampunk. Is I, I suppose it's a kind of um, it's a genre of fantastical historical fiction. It's about um, uh, kind of the 18th century. Um, it's that sort of confluence between kind of Brit the British Empire and kind of steam trains, locomotives, and steam technology. Um, and I guess the punk part comes in with it's 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 really about like it, what if the world kind of took a, a left turn instead of a right turn and instead of aeroplanes it, we have dirigibles and we I mean it's the thing is steam it's, su it's such a broad category I mean so Jules Verne is also even though around the world in 80 days itself doesn't have any steampunk elements he's pretty much the grandfather of steampunk kind of invented the genre um, and if I can add part of what steampunk is about is what if we had computers back then right, and technology absolutely. so part of what you do in 80 days is imagine if people who were colonized had access to this technology right. and could use it to resist exactly. that cultural oppression. Like, I mean, so this is the thing is it's so we keep telling the story of what steampunk London would look like. And as interesting as that is, I don't think it's as interesting as, you know, what does steampunk Bangalore look like? What does steampunk, you know, Lebanon look like? Um, and that's what we really tried to do in the game. We kind of tried to, um, to, to move kind of the idea, like, so technological, we try to kind of take the idea of technological invention uh, and the idea uh, and all of the, the kind of, uh, there's really a sense of wonder in kind of technology and the world and this, cha this idea of kind of change um, and spread that more evenly kind of throughout the globe. Um, there's a really great essay by Amal al uh which is called Towards a Steampunk Without Steam, which was one of the, one of the influences um, for 80 days which kind of posits, so what, what does steampunk look like if you're in a desert culture and water is precious? You know, what, you, it wouldn't be steam trains, it wouldn't be boilers, it would be something else, and what would that be? And I think that's what we really try to do in 80 days. Um, not only kind of say, let's stick cogs on everything, but kind of go into specific cultures, look at their, the resources available to them, look at the kind of socio-political issues around them, and kind of try and play that out through the technologies we invent. Like, why would they invent mechanical camels? And what would mechanical camels do to the kind of geopolitics of the region? Um, and I think that's one of the ways in which our fantasy is grounded. And it also feels respectful as well. Um, that we're not just kind of taking a model of, you know, 
British Victorian steampunk and reapplying that everywhere as if that is what it would be like, you know, that the idea of, of the future, that, that vision of the future is so limited and not everyone would see the future the same way and how exciting is it to be able to kind of imagine what I might have thought of as futurism in 1872. Amy, you talked about oral storytelling being an important force for cultural transmission within the Inupiaq tradition. Can you tell us more about what it means to think about bringing that tradition into a game space? How much did it feel natural and a different, just a new technology for doing it? Or did it feel like you were doing something in a whole different way? I think for me, it was more about doing storytelling in a different way. You know, we have always continued our storytelling traditions, whether it's telling traditional stories like Kunuk Sayaka, if you're never alone, or even just telling stories around the kitchen table about, did you know so-and-so caught a caribou and it was this big and really it was not that big. <laughs> you know, it was <laughs> one of those things about um, the cultures, any culture around the world is that that piece of connection through um, storytelling is a key part of it. And, you know, video games has that power to connect people. It's something that, you know, I started off when I grew up, I grew up with an Atari. It wasn't very connecting, but now it's emerged into this amazing space where people can connect to each other. So storytelling is really a natural, you know, evolution in video games. So before we open up for some questions, I wanted to ask you both, can you share with us a little bit about what impact you've seen or would hope to see amongst the communities you're representing in the stories who get to participate in playing it? And at the same time, folks like me, who don't come from either of the communities represented, um, who get to feel like by stepping into the shoes being offered through the characters that I'm somehow within the culture, participating, as you said, telling that story or co-telling that story. Um, well, I mean, my answer for this is gonna be much shorter than Amy's, I'm sure. Um, I mean, I think, what it, I, I think that a huge, part of why 80 Days has spoken to a lot of people is the fact that it is inclusive and diverse. And I, I'd say it's probably as much about race and culture as it is about gender uh, and about kind of, um, you know, LGBTQ representation because there are, there are gay and trans people in our game uh, and half of our airship pilots are women. Um, and in some ways, you know, I think um, the, the fact that we're inclusive in terms of culture tends to come up a lot less unless it's a review that is by someone who, who's from kind of non-Western culture. And there are lots fewer of those people around. Uh, but I do remember a really wonderful review that really um, really stuck in my mind. Uh, it was um, a Japanese woman reviewing the game and she's pointed out that at one point when you're in kind of, you meet um, a kind of a ship's captain who's carrying around his dad's katana and you have a conversation about kind of the Meiji Revolution and you know, Eastern morals, Western technology, which is the, mm. the catchphrase of the time. And she was just, I think she, she was just really touched that, that that was in the game because it was like, she's like, wow, someone has actually done this research and bothered and cared about my culture. And I remember, I remember feeling like that. So, I mean, I remember reading Passage to India in Bangalore for school and no one, none of my teachers ever mentioned the word race. Like we read it as though, we read it with a kind of weird gratitude that, you know, Western canon was acknowledging India and writing a book about India. And that's kind of <laughs> not good enough, really. Um, you know, like, I mean, at one point, Forster, as much as I admire him as a writer, does just describe Indians as polite, cunning people. And no, like we never discussed, we never took that apart in a class in Bangalore, like 40 years after Indian independence. That's kind of crazy to me. And so, you know, I think if, if, I think games make it, I think because games are so, like, and reading, like 80 Days is, is a game that's mostly told through text. It's incredibly accessible to people who aren't kind of game players. And I think if that starts one conversation with one adult, I hope it has. Well, I think for me, starting with the local community, you know, we've started with this idea for Never Alone to really as a, a way to sustain Cook Inlet Tribal Council's mission and how we connect with over 12,000 Alaskan natives annually in areas of education and employment and training. But going beyond that, really what we wanna do is, is spark and inspire an interest in this genre world game. I think storytelling has the power to connect and games has the power to connect. And when you put those two together, you amplify that, you know, the power that they have. And really what I think is happening is that there is a hunger out there 
there. So I'm, I'm thrilled that we did a game on Inupiaq, but I am also excited to see what's next. You know, other cultures around the world have been approaching Uline Media and how did you do this? What's this inclusive development? And, mm -hmm. you know, I think what I hope to see is this will be something, the world game genre will be something that'll be a standard in, you know, the next few years and people will be hungry for it. They'll wait for the next one. And it's just exciting to be a part of it. I like that, that phrase. I haven't heard it before, world games. Thank you. So I think we have probably time for one question. Is there a mic out there for folks? And if not, come on up. I'm going to throw you one. Come on up. I see you right there. Come on up, please. Oh, there's a mic up. I'm sorry. I'm making one for no reason. Right up there. Thank you. Sorry. Work with this one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll work with it this time. Hey. So Can you tell us who um, you are first, please? Uh, hi, my name is Tree Statu. I'm from the American University Game Lab, and um, I'm in love with Never Alone, I played the whole thing, it's a topic of a research paper and this world games thing. Um, I actually kind of thought about just now and how to define it beyond, you know, World of Warcraft and Tolkien folklore and, and, and fantasy games. And so, is it called a world game because after you play the game, there's a world around you after? You, if, if, if that's concise enough, sorry, I'm kind of flustered. <laughs> no, I think that's a very interesting way to look at it. Um, I think that's definitely one way to frame it. I think where we were coming from is that starting the genre of rural games is really an invitation for others to share their stories. And it's not necessarily that it has to be an indigenous culture, but I think there are so many other beautiful stories out there and so many people around the world who want to engage in this type of game making that we're hoping that it spurs that type of game that really captures people's imagination and draws them in and makes them curious to find out more. Yeah, I see a hand up front, that gentleman. I don't know if he's a British gentleman or not, this gentleman. So you mentioned the Sorry, notion can you introduce of yourself first, please? Oh, my name is Greg Garvey. I'm director of game design and development at Quinnipiac University. So I'm, I'm thinking of an absurdity, a kind of thought experiment, but we have heard how ISIS, ISIL, Dash, has mastered technology and social media. So suppose they create a game called The Caliphate, 80 Days. <laughs> They're change makers. Should they be welcomed to this stage? Wow. <laughs> Definitely not a question. Okay. <laughs> Trying to work out how to not get myself in trouble over the next three minutes. Um, do you know, I kind of think, I kind of, I would tend to say yes, because I think, you know, if you want to change people's minds, I think if you think of, <laughs> I mean, I don't know, but I suspect that a lot of people who maybe might support ISIL might not. It, I, I don't know, like I kind of think um, that engaging people in conversation is never a bad thing. Um, and understanding where people are coming from is never a bad thing, um, especially if you want to argue them out of a position. Uh, so yeah, I mean, like, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure that the situation is really gonna come up. <laughs> Maybe the next game's for Change Festival. Maybe you've just given them an idea. <laughs> <laughs> you want to add anything to that? Or? Uh, I don't know if I want to touch get yourself in trouble as well. No, I, no, I agree with you, Meg, that starting a conversation is important, and we just have to be aware that we aren't always going to make everyone happy, yeah. you know, and we can't always change people's mind, but I think if we turn our back on an issue, it's never going to be solved. Right, and I think difficult topics, I think we should be addressing more difficult topics in games in general. Great. Meg, Amy, thank you both very much. Thank, thank you. you.